fascinating guy, Steve McQueen. He became a race car driver. Like, se yeah, well, serious race car driver. What do I remember most about my childhood? Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, if you want to know. That's that great. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing, Dr. Well, like I told Max, I was trying to cut my way through your wire because I want to get out. Do you really know about the tragic life behind the spotlight of Steve McQueen, the iconic actor whose name is etched in cinematic history? Known for his spellbinding performances and unforgettable roles in classics like Bullet and The Great Escape, McQueen captivated audiences worldwide. However, beyond his mesmerizing on-screen presence and the glamour that surrounded him, there was a more complex and less seen side to this legendary figure. Renowned for his intense personality and an insatiable drive for on-screen dominance, McQueen's interpersonal relationships, especially with some of his co-stars, were often tumultuous. Join us as we uncover the behind-the-scenes stories that reveal a different side to Steve McQueen, exploring why he wasn't the favorite of several of his contemporaries. Feud between Garner and McQueen. James Garner and Paul Newman both starred with McQueen. Garner was one of Hollywood's most easygoing figures, and he did not bother to filter or mince his words when asked to describe his experience with McQueen. He gave a blunt assessment of McQueen's career and shortcomings, but he summed it up nicely and brutally in four honest words. The kiss of death. Funny, right? It was like a stark contrast between the gentle and dove-like nature of Garner and his deathly remark about his co-star, which left quite an impression on the public and, who knows, maybe hinted at some hidden tensions that were bubbling beneath the surface of Hollywood's glamorous stage. Having co-starred with McQueen in The Great Escape, and being known for his blunt and sometimes hurtful honesty, offering his unbiased, maybe or maybe not, opinion about McQueen's approach to acting also got most people thinking that maybe they were rivals, which, to be honest, is something that is not uncommon in Hollywood and also what the public loves. Now, most people love the tea of celebrities. Garner acknowledged that McQueen has a very impressive and formidable presence on set, which is parallel to that of Marlon Brando. But he also said he is, quote, a movie star rather than a true actor. He also said that after having observed McQueen, he noticed that McQueen often relied on a carefully cultivated persona and a constructed image of machismo that could be injected into every role, regardless of the character's nuances. Although the public and audiences loved the consistency of the McQueen-esque persona, Garner saw it more as a limiting factor, and that was why he stated that it was a kiss of death as far as he was concerned. He believed that an actor's true skill lies in being able to inhabit a character seamlessly and to be able to allow the audience to completely forget the actor and become immersed in the role the actor plays. McQueen's challenges extended beyond his acting methods, as he was said to have quite a temperament and a stubborn nature for not compromising throughout his career, which is an incredible feat on its own. Garner recounted an instant on the set of The Great Escape, where McQueen was almost about to storm off to express his dissatisfaction with his character's arc, as he wanted a more heroic type that could resonate with the image of himself rather than what was needed in the script. While this may not seem like a big deal, it may have delayed the time spent on the set and held them back more. McQueen's Strong Character Instead of Garner resorting to confrontation, known for his diplomacy and lack of ego, he chose a delicate negotiation. He was able to see McQueen's stubbornness, something that he readily acknowledged, but he also noticed the insecurities underlying and driving McQueen's demands. So to find common ground and move forward, the director and Garner collaborated on significant changes as McQueen's character was reshaped to become a more daring character. Motorcycle stunts were introduced as he was a reconnaissance agent, willingly sacrificing capture to gather crucial intelligence. A beautiful masterpiece of common ground was made, not affecting or hurting both the ego of McQueen and the script's originality too much, which created a great movie. Despite the weird moments, both co-stars maintained a good friendship, 
as this was able to work out with Garner's ability to calmly navigate the difficult part of working with such a strong-headed personality, as some other actors find themselves clashing with McQueen's fiery spirit. The relationship between Bud Ekins, the stunt coordinator for The Great Escape, and McQueen exemplifies this dynamic. Ekins, a respected figure in his own right, played a vital role in creating the memorable motorcycle escape sequence for the film. However, their collaboration was not without its challenges. McQueen, known for his need for control and perfectionism, clashed with Eakins's independent spirit and improvisational approach. Despite the outcome of the stunt choreography, disagreements and tension were prevalent throughout the process. These stories provide a glimpse into Steve McQueen's world. He was driven by a hunger for success, aspiring to be seen as both a force on screen and off. Understanding these complexities is essential to appreciating Steve McQueen's legacy. He was more than a symbol of coolness. He was a multifaceted artist grappling with struggles while navigating the challenging terrain of Hollywood. In his account of the Great Escape Adventure, he explores the complexities of working in the world of art, the difficulties of nurturing friendships amidst competition, and our universal longing for recognition and approval. The legendary Hollywood actor Paul Newman brought into light the convoluted facets of the film industry with his highly forthright but bitter criticism of McQueen. Through this terse and stinging remark, insights are gleaned about the brutal competitiveness and ruthlessness within show business. James Garner might have had audiences falling for him as their favorite on-screen protagonist. However, when it comes to sharing his thoughts privately about McQueen, a contrasting narrative appears. The disparity between how he came across publicly and their collaboration, one that transpired behind closed doors against Charlie Brown's voice, lays bare an unexplored element in their collaboration on viewers, characterized by disagreement and conflict. McQueen's Master Class Steve McQueen left an enduring impression in cinema history by wowing fans with his performance as Hiltz during the World War II epoch, The Great Escape, which was released in 1963. Indeed, pencils sketched out scenes that dazzled viewers, courtesy of McQueen being able to channel elegance effortlessly while oozing magnetism without breaking a sweat. Such was its power that its ephemeral charm was indelibly etched into celluloid landscapes. However, delving deeper past flickering screen glamour scintigraphy led the audience straight onto secluded turf specially meant for a make-believe wartime camp called Stalag Luft III, revealing a compelling plot unfolding and sprinkling drama within boundaries. One rivalry in the Hollywood pantheon stands out for its palpable tension and clash of egos. The tempestuous relationship between Steve McQueen, the rising rebel, and Yul Brynner, the established king of the silver screen. Their paths crossed on the dusty plains of the Magnificent Seven in 1960, a Western epic that was destined to become a cinematic legend. And yet behind the camera, a different story was unfolding a story of ambition, insecurity, and an unquenchable thirst for the limelight. Brynner, a giant who had already inscribed his name in gold with roles such as Pharaoh in The Ten Commandments and the king in The King and I, carried himself like a veteran king. He ruled the roost in the golden age of Hollywood, his towering presence leaving little space for pretenders to his throne. Along comes Steve McQueen, a young firebrand with a simmering intensity and the swagger of a rebel. He was unwilling to be confined in the darkness, his eyes set on the summit of the ladder. Sparks flew while making The Magnificent Seven. On screen, they represented tough solidarity, a group of outlaws fighting for a just cause. However, behind the scenes, a silent war was waged, where stolen glances, Subtle body language and occasional calculated outbursts were used as weapons. McQueen, who was famous for his mischievous grin and audacious stunts, would not stand being number two. He ad-libbed brave stunts, stole the spotlight with witty lines, and even supposedly accidentally 
toppled Brenner's carefully placed props. Every scene became a silent fight, a subtle battle for attention that left the atmosphere full of unspoken malice. Brenner, who had been used to receiving respect, kept getting more and more aggravated. It is said that he forbade McQueen's spontaneous performances in a vain bid to regain authority over his scenes. McQueen, though, never submitted to intimidation easily. He turned the restrictions into fire fuel, coming up with ingenious ways to steal attention even within the narrow confines of scripted performances. The camera was like a voyeur, picking up the unspoken tension. Brenner's stoic, almost sullen facade, barely hiding his irritation, McQueen's pent-up energy simmering just below the surface. It is hard to imagine what inspired this competition. Was it mere professional jealousy, an acting battle of styles, or something primal need for dominance, a power struggle on screen and off screen, a battle of who was the alpha male? Maybe it was a stew of all these, a festering broth of insecurities and egos amplified by the intensity of a busy set. Brenner, who was already an old hand in Hollywood, showed up on set reflecting the aura of his Academy Award for The King and I, as well as his confidence in his status as an established star. He pictured the film as a vehicle to secure his leading man credentials and carefully abided by his mastery authority. McQueen, by contrast, was a young man of great potential, whose reputation preceded him with his anti-tragic bravery and unyielding self-assurance. To him, the film was a platform to be the leaping pole for his ascension, and Brenner's authoritativeness was an impediment to be conquered, not a limit to be respected. This basic disparity in temperaments lays the groundwork for discord. However, the improvisational nature of McQueen did not fit well with Brenner's highly organized plans. He ignored the commands with impunity, introducing unprescribed maneuvers and crazy stunts in his scenes, giving the whole thing a wild unpredictability that thrilled and grated on Brenner. The ensemble cast, a virtual list of who's who in the West, including James Coburn, Charles Bronson, and Eli Wallach, became a minuscule version of Hollywood's self-centered society, with McQueen at the epicenter of the vortex. His frustration reached its climax when he realized that in the original manuscript, the character had a small amount of speech, only seven lines. Therefore, McQueen's pressure on director John Sturgis was due to his fear of his role becoming lost in the shadows. To placate him, Sturgis allowed McQueen limited camera control, a compromise that was to be a two-edged sword. However, McQueen, feeling emboldened by this newly found power, used it to eclipse Brenner and take all the lights for himself. His strategies varied from the insidious to the puppy-like. While Brenner was speaking, McQueen did not simply sit quietly behind him. Rather, he flipped coins or rattled his shotgun shells to attract the camera's attention from Brenner to himself. He even went as far as ruining Brenner's physique, kicking away a heap of dirt that Brenner had piled up so that he would look taller in the scenes in which they both acted. The tension escalated to a boiling point during a particular incident recounted in Mark Elliott's 2005 biography, Steve McQueen, A Biography, of Fitz. Brenner took McQueen in a threatening manner, the palpable animosity between them uploading into a public act. Ruminating on this event, McQueen admitted to the hatred, saying, We did not like each other. He reasoned that Brenner hated him, as he was an envious man who feared that McQueen could take his place. He implied that Brenner was afraid of losing his position because McQueen lacked horseback riding skills and gun craft. The feud between McQueen and Brenner was not just a battle of personalities, but ultimately a struggle for dominance within the hepburn Carey story. Both actors appreciated the presence of the audience and desired to be watched. However, how they both sought it out created a sense of uneasiness. The insubordinate talents and improvisational style carried by McQueen brought a gritty vibrance to the film. However, it also sabotaged Brenner's meticulous performance and his status as the leading man was at risk. The troubles that resulted from this feud were rife, 
It spoiled the studio production and casting, creating a hostile environment and tension all over the place. It also influenced the color tone of the film, introducing a slight dissonance to the fraternal relationship shared by the Seven Magnificents. However, despite such a hostile atmosphere, The Magnificent Seven stands as one of the most iconic Western movies to date that is solely based on the outstanding efforts put up by its actors and production team. While the feud between McQueen and Brenner is certainly a remarkable element in the film's history, it also makes us recall that sometimes even the most influential cinematographic unions carry quite a few concealed difficulties and personal issues within themselves. Hollywood always has a hand in every fear of strong individuals and the fires that started from their crashes. Two such clashes cast long shadows over the film world. The ongoing villa-on-set feud between Steve McQueen and Yul Brynner in The Magnificent Seven, and the long-standing rivalry of McQueen and Paul Newman throughout the 60s and 70s. These rivals, fueled by strong jealousy, ego, and hyper-competition, of course, were not limited only to the silver screen. They exposed a layer of some hidden currents in the industry. The war between McQueen and Brenner in The Magnificent Seven broke out like desert lightning. Brenner, a dedicated and Oscar-winning actor, followed the well-established gravitas of a ruling gunfighter, carefully maintaining his role as the main protagonist. McQueen, a struggling young star on fire with subversive vitality, regarded the project as her teenage springboard to superstardom and Brenner's tyranny as a challenge to be fought against. This basic conflict, in some way, inflamed their rancor. McQueen was fond of improvisation, putting unplanned moves into his scenes, whereas Brenner wanted precision and also planned everything out to a T. This discord was in artless forms, with McQueen stealing the show from Brenner through minor schemes like jangling his shells while he gave speeches. Robert Vaughn's 2008 autobiography addresses yet another level of jealousy that plagued the two, as McQueen was envious of Brenner's renowned screen weapon, Sato, which created another fictional rivalry beyond their acting battle. Their conflict was no longer harmless passive aggression. Brenner's frustration overpowers him and erupts into a full-blown confrontation, which takes place in front of the entire set as the camera continues to roll, where he grabs McQueen and exclaims, this event was not just a squabble. It did crown the fight for supremacy in the film's plot. Both actors wanted to be in the spotlight, but their styles were different, so this produced a sort of basso sato or undercurrent of tension, Newman and McQueen. On the other hand, a new rivalry was starting to emerge in the fast-paced world of racing. This was because McQueen and Newman, two of Richard Dick Barber's protégés in the driving school, were pitting themselves against each other on the racetracks. Both the approaches of Newman to racing seem to be founded on methodical discipline, which is evident from his constant training and practice, while McQueen adopts a wilder intuitive style. Their rivalry went into the time that they spent on the track. McQueen allegedly resented Newman's achievements but claimed that he could master the track in three days. On the racetrack, McQueen's inborn skill at driving conflicted with Newman's breeding thoroughness. McQueen, it seems, was born with a steering wheel in one hand and knew how to drive instinctively. On the other hand, Newman did not make much of it at first, as his natural talent was subdued by conscious self-improvement efforts. Combining this inequality with McQueen's ironclad belief in his superiority, fuel was added to the fire of their war. Considering they both loved horse racing equally, they never raced against each other as no official race was ever held between them. The question of who reigned supreme thus went unanswered. The possibility to work in collaboration with the big screen offered a possible turning point, but unfortunately, it was nothing more than a showcase for the intricacies of their dynamics. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid tempted, promising a part to be equal with the other actors. Still, there is no way that William McQueen would agree to do this with Newman, especially where the issue of top billing is concerned. Newman, the Hollywood veteran, 
could assert an established claim, while McQueen regarded it as an irrevocable crime. Unable to find an explanation that allowed him to make sense of the perceived insult, McQueen took the fatal step of walking away, thereby altering the film industry and deepening their relationship yet further. Hollywood is driven by personalities coming together. The delicate dance of beings creating magic in front of the camera. However, while some of these partnerships become legendary stories of synergy, as the best partners like to say, others burn with the friction of clashing egos. On the set of The Towering Inferno, the simmering rivalry between Steve McQueen and Paul Newman and the counterintuitive meeting with Michael Fassbender offer two fascinating glimpses of this dynamic. As the Inferno raged on in The Towering Inferno, there were high tensions between McQueen and Newman. The great writer A. E. Hotner painted a sharp picture of several occasions where Newman openly ridiculed McQueen, calling him a chicken, that is, a petty man with grievances. This intense depiction reveals the degree of fray that prevailed in their working relationships, indicating what such two significant actors were up against when wanting to achieve success within the same film industry. Their competition wasn't just a vicious fight. It was a richly textured tapestry of sudden, sharp strands of envy and ambition and the sheer weight of that old Hollywood soap opera. The insecurities and anxieties that attended the pressure to succeed, to be at the top of one's game and under the sometimes relentless gaze of fame were reflected in each male's opposite. This combustible blend only intensified their competition, driving them to reach new heights as they simultaneously created an insecure and unspoken environment of throwdown. In complete contrast, the partnership that was formed by McQuise and Fassbender is a symbol of the change brought about by mutual respect and creative harmony. Nevertheless, their travel was not easy or free from initial obstacles. While taking part in the discussions regarding McQueen's directorial debut, Hunger, there was a sense of discomfort that dominated the room. First, in the course of incorporating McQueen into the filmmaking world, the acclaimed director initially mistook Fassbender's closed attitude for arrogance by challenging his intentions and commitment. This weight on both sides, perhaps in hindsight, stems from dealing with an unstable and uncertain environment which almost threatened their venture into each other's world. However, it seems that fate, often an excellent scriptwriter, took an unprecedented turn. Even though McQueen had doubts, he gave Fassbender the chance to audition again. This defining point became a catalyst for change, not only for the film, but also for their relationship. McQueen finally wanted Fassbender to strip off his wariness during the successive auditions and reveal a depth and vulnerability that corresponded with his understanding of Bobby Sands. This disclosure not only helped Fassbender get the role, but also showed a deep change in power relations between them. The following was their moment of mutual understanding, during which a beneficial relationship bloomed. However, McQueen did not look at Fassbender as a brash young newcomer, but rather as an outstanding performer capable of exploring the most enigmatic and scary human depths. This allowed Fassbender to prosper under McQueen's unyielding gaze, perfecting his art and discovering a balanced style that incorporated both physical bravado and emotional frailty. This unique style made him an individual among his contemporaries, meaning he was a rare, productive force in the film. As they worked together, their relationship became almost symbiotic, and their respect for each other was both profound and deep. The first one was an important character to McQueen, who appeared both in Hunger and the award-winning Shame in 2011. He was not just an actor, he was a close and reliable friend who gave McQueen sound advice about the direction of his art. This interplay achieved its climax in shame as they shared a deep urge to plunge into the sublime depths of human darkness and gave us a film gritty and searing. 
The McQueen Fassbender story matches the contrast between the clash between McQueen and Newman. Indeed, it makes us remember that collaboration can become a cathartic power, not only for artistic masterpieces, but also for the deep connections in people's hearts. While the McQueen New Man feud contains a strong message against the competition's grim underbelly, the McQueen Fassbender Agency embodies the power of artistic collaboration and mutual admiration. Cool representation, pseudo suprahuman Steve McQueen achieved cinematic immortality beyond his silver screen and ended up being known to the world as Hollywood. He was a man with an undeniable amount of charisma, and his screen presence was electrifying, but that does not mean that it did have some difficult undercurrents in the way. Through the awe-inspiring performances of Maverick's protagonists, McQueen's behavior in Hollywood nearly always fell short of his on-screen image. Likewise, McQueen's reputation among his peers was a peculiar paradox. His skills and qualities were applauded by audiences as raw talent and magnetic charm, but his acting skills were seen with astonishment just within the boundaries of Hollywood as more like a movie star than an actor for the truth. This perception, though reinforced by the whispering of his on-set feuds and inflexible dedication to the hyper-masculine character, often and even too many times overshadowed his concretely undisputed talent. His fighting with characters such as Yul Brynner was just the beginning of a great heap. Many other top stars have nursed a grudge against McQueen for years now. While his uncompromising dedication to maintaining macho on the screen was captivating for many viewers, it was seen by others as an obstacle to the collective spirit one would wish to see prevailing on any film set. Lack of flexibility and consistency is another potential problem in McQueen's work, as his attention to preserving his meticulously perfected image could interfere with the process of creative work and lead to an atmosphere of discomfort and awkwardness. It is when we take a closer look into the subtle locations of McQueen's relationships in the industry that we speak about the intricacy in Hollywood, where dazzling and impressive on-screen presence hid something completely different behind itself. This gives the background of lost battles due to dissonances between his charming persona and conflicts caused by his peers. His undeniable talent, which was at the same time undeniable magnetism, also received acclaim. However, his not very productive collaboration and interpersonal dynamics put a shadow on his career, making a picture of the man who likes to fight against the system that started and developed him. Hollywood collaborations are intricate, and almost every actor has had a problem solving this maze, but then the maze seemed to be improving exponentially for McQueen. His battles with inner demons, his ID molding technique, and constant fights for dominance over the industry give this legacy some benevolence in combination with some reddens. People found themselves in awe of him through his sheer charismatic screen presence and undisputed talent, where he would leave a string of unworkable partnerships and personal spats. McQueen's Legacy Nevertheless, McQueen's legacy does not stand as a man to so-called on-set fights. The death occurred too soon and left him a treasure inherited because of the film performances as well as his name, image, and associated rights. Post-mortem management of such assets sparked a series of controversies and legal battles, highlighting the different intricacies often associated with his character. The appropriation of McQueen's image became a contested terrain as many companies sought to cash in on his enduring popularity and macho persona for their commercial interests. Generally, the estate, which was mostly managed by his children and heirs, adopted a watchful attitude toward protecting his legacy and filed legal suits against misuse of his name. As an example, a lawsuit filed in 2010 against Ferrari for their marketing of a car, as the McQueen is seen as a testament to how passionate this estate was in ensuring that the connection between its son and racing and automobiles was kept intact. On the other hand, internal conflicts within the estate came to pass as well. 
there was massive discontent among the heirs on how to balance the best interests of McQueen's legacy and capitalize on the ongoing public interest in his life and career. This tension brings to light some of the negotiations being perpetuated to be able to manage the legacy of a cultural icon, in which money has to be made, but also the artistic integrity and personal memories. The fact that these controversies have been around for such a long time does not affect McQueen's estate's ambition to both preserve and celebrate his legacy. The same goes for documentaries about his biography and lifestyle, as well as for brands that he endorses that are in tune with his impression. Through strategic manipulation of the tale that his life and work became, they attempt to depict a full picture of a man who lay beyond the role on screen. Thanks for watching. Make sure to check out another of our interesting videos by clicking on the link appearing on your screen right now. See you soon.